I've seen that video at least a half dozen times in different iterations. We tried to trim that down to the typical three minute length for a service, but it was just so good we had to show you the whole thing. Well, that's only, it's 90 minutes of her talking. I love Christine's story. I know Christine, I love her story. Uh, I get, when I see it, even just now, I get so grateful to God uh, for what he's doing in her life. And just sometimes hearing people's stories reminds you that this, we're not playing a game here. This isn't just playing church. God's real. He's at work. He's changing people's lives. And we don't always see that or pay attention to it. And I get, hopefully in the right way, proud of our church. That we're trying to love people who, like she said, who are these people that don't even know me and are willing to love me and serve me this way? When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment in all the Bible was. He said, well, it's really two, co- two sides of one coin. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Those two things go together. Love your neighbor as yourself. Christine's story is a beautiful example of both. Love for God and love for our neighbor. One of the most profound things she said, I don't know if you caught this, hopefully you're paying attention. If you missed some of that, if you, if you zoned out, shame on you, but you can go online. <laughs> and uh, watch the whole video in its entirety. I loved what she said. I guess what I want to share is that I'm you. I'm the person sitting next to you at a coffee shop, next door neighbor. Sometimes we think about, you know, the people that need help or to serve is out there somewhere. It's right here. It's one thing to talk about loving humanity in general, right? We should love people. But that's a sort of a, it's sort of abstract. People in general, yes, we should love them. Most of them. Some of them that are like me, right? But people, we should love you, being kind to others. But when you talk about loving your neighbor and you put a face to that, loving people in general doesn't necessarily ask anything of us, right? Just something we ought to do in the abstract sense. When you have a face and a name and it's your neighbor, someone you work with, live next to, carpool with, your kids play together, when you see that person and know that person and you're asked to love that person, Jesus tells us not love your, the world in general. He says love your neighbor. He doesn't say love God and just in general have a good attitude toward people. He says love God and love your neighbor. G.K. Chesterton wrote, we make our friends, we make our enemies. <laughs> I think he's right. But God makes our next door neighbor. We must love our neighbor because he is there. He is the sample of humanity which is actually given to us. The tangible representation of people in general is the person sitting next to you, living next to you, working next to you. That's what the next three weeks are about. The next three weeks, called the art of neighboring, are about what does that look like? What does that mean for us as Christ followers? How, specifically, do we love our neighbor? Here at FBCG, we say often that we believe the gospel transforms lives and that transformed lives impact the world. You heard Pastor Brian say it. You heard me say it. We say it all the time. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms people. That's what was happening in Christine's heart. And that people then, she, you heard what she said? She says, I want to get to that place where I'm doing this for people. The transformed people then want to make an impact in the world for the sake of the gospel. The point is that transformation and impact start in your own heart and right next to you. Not out there in an abstract sense. And I'm guilty of this too. It's one thing to stand up here and preach a message to a whole crowd. It's another thing to sit face-to-face with somebody, listen to them, talk about their needs, and love them. Transformation and impact start in here and right next door. So let's look at the heart of Jesus. That's a good place to start, isn't it? The heart of Jesus as it relates to this. If you have your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 9. If not, look at the enormous screen. Verses 35 to 38. Matthew 9, verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The context here is that Jesus is traveling town to town, village to village, and he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, the gospel. The word gospel means good news. He's teaching the good news of God's kingdom made manifest in his presence, his message, and his death to be and resurrection to come. 
And as he's doing this, there's a buzz about him, not surprisingly. And people talk in small towns that are nearby, and word spreads, and as he travels, crowds start to gather. Big crowds for that region. And we're told Jesus' reaction to the crowd. The text simply says when he sees the crowds, he has compassion on them because they are like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I thought about this as I was reading through this passage and thinking about this sermon. Jesus is traveling with his disciples in the northern part of the country of Israel called Galilee. That's where he is when this is taking place. His disciples are with him. They see and experience the same crowds. But they don't have the same reaction. They don't see them the same way. This is the first thing I want to point out. Loving your neighbor means to see what Jesus saw. Or see what Jesus sees in our context. Of course, he, he, he saw a crowd. He was aware of the presence of a lot of people. So are the disciples. But he saw more than that. He saw into them, into their lives, into their, their hearts. You see here an image of the, on the screen of Jerusalem at the time of a festival. I, I didn't take this picture. This is thanks to Google Images, but... Uh, when we visited Jerusalem, that wall you see there in the distance, the crowd is all pressing up against is the western wall. Sometimes you've heard of the Wailing Wall. That's the wall of the Temple Mount. You have a mixture of Jews and Muslims there, mostly Jews down there at a time of a festival, and it's the crowd, right, in the holy city, crowds around. To put it in our context, another image here of a crowd in the city streets. My wife and kids and I were down at Navy Pier this, a couple weekends ago. It's a big crowd sitting there waiting for our name to be called to go into Bubba Gump's and eat dinner. We're just watching people. How many of you like to people watch? Who enjoys watching people? Can we admit that? It's fun, isn't it? Airports, crowded city streets, beaches, someplace where there's lots of people to sit sort of with your back against the wall and just watch people, observe them. And if I'm honest, too often I watch them to make fun of them. Do you do that? Do you watch them to see some funny behavior, some odd quirky thing that you can giggle about or point out, you know? And I realize they're probably doing that to me when I'm walking around. Every now and then, though, I try to see them as God sees them. To look at people and wonder, what's their life like? What are their hopes and dreams and fears and regrets and pains? What does God see when he looks at that person that I'm tempted to ignore or to make fun of? To see people as individuals that he created with dignity and value and worth and that he desperately loves. Do you ever do that? You people watch. Do you ever try and consciously see what God sees when he looks at people? I can remember sitting on a dock with my dad watching people come and launch their boats. Just making fun of them. Just giggling about how the back of the boat in, messing it up, yelling at each other. We had a, a grand old time doing that. Do you ever stop, though, and say, what does God see when he looks at that person? We ought too often, if, or for honesty, see crowds of people as an inconvenience, don't we? Come on, in traffic? Do you, how many of you when you're in, tra- in a traffic jam or creeping along during rush hour go, what does God see? He looks at all these cars. <laughs> you want him to part the Red Sea like Moses, right, so you can drive. In Matthew 14, verse 15, though, Jesus is speaking to crowds, and it's getting late, and the crowds are hungry, and they're getting restless, and the disciples come to Jesus in Matthew 14, verse 15, and they say, send them away. Send them away, there are too many for us. It's not Jesus' attitude. He says, no, no, we're not sending anybody anywhere. You feed them. We're going to take care of them. One of my favorite stories is in Luke chapter 7. We won't go into it in detail, but the context is Jesus is having dinner at a guest at a friend's house. Well, not really a friend. He's a guest at Simon's house. Simon is a Pharisee, an important religious man in that community. And he's sort of snubbing Jesus with little slights throughout the dinner party. And during the course of the dinner party, a woman comes up and begins to weep at Jesus' feet and wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair. Perhaps you remember that part of the story. And she's a woman of not such a good reputation. And everybody notices. How could you not? And Jesus asked the most profound but simple question. The text says he turns to the woman and he says to Simon, Do you see this woman? Now, physically speaking, he was aware of her presence. He saw that she was there, but he didn't see her. Not the way Jesus saw her. Not as a person of dignity and worth and value that matters deeply, that's broken and in need of his love. 
Do you see this woman? The first step, I think, in learning to love our neighbor is to see them. Do you see them? I mean, you're aware of somebody that lives next door to you, works in the cube next to you, that you carpool with. You see them physically, but do you see into their life? Do you care enough to ask, I want to see what you see, Jesus? Not long ago, uh, a couple years ago, actually, but uh, my neighbor, Dale, who had gotten to know, uh, moved away, retired, moved to Door County. He, he was a little bit quirky, interesting guy. He fed peanuts to the squirrels, and all the neighbors hated him because peanut pa- plants were always growing in our yard. I'd find peanut shells in my basement when the mice would bring them in. But he'd pay my boys to feed the squirrels peanuts. My boys loved Dale. He moved, and a couple moved in next door. And I was busy at that time of my life. My kids were in school and doing all kinds of activities. I didn't really get to know them. And then I noticed that he wasn't around. The husband wasn't around much. And then I noticed that she had different people coming and going, and the yard was unkept. And I just, you know, kind of did my own thing. But recently I had to go and uh, ask permission to stand on her property to cut my bushes, which are growing over her fence into her yard. So I said, I'm not done the door. Do you mind if I stand here? i got to cut these bushes. And she came to the door, and I could just tell by looking at her and the room behind her that all was not well. She says, sure, no problem, whatever. And, and her, little, her little boy runs up, barefoot, looks behind her you know, legs, you know, says, my dog just died. He says that, you know. So oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Actually, I wasn't that sorry. That dog was annoying, but that's another story. <laughs> so sorry to hear that. And I asked her, I said, hey, I'm sorry. She said, well, we won't be here very long. She goes to tell me a very sad, painful story about brokenness in her marriage and financial difficulty and listened to her. And I said, can I pray with you? My wife then heard that I told, shared with her, and she's gone over, and they've been there for over a year. Never once knocked on the door. Never once saw her or her kids. Not, not really, you know. I'm aware that they're there. I never saw them. All this is going on right next door. Because I drive in my garage, close the door, go in my house, go in the back, which is mostly hedged, you know, and sit on my deck. I don't have to see people. What did Jesus see when he looked at the crowd? People who were, the text says, harassed and helpless. Literally, the Greek means burdened and weighed down, under a heavy load. Spiritually, he sees the people, the crowd. He doesn't just see a mass of humanity. He sees individual people who are carrying weight, carrying burdens, cast down. He saw their spiritual condition, in other words. He saw their great need. And then he says they're like sheep without a shepherd. He called them this. Now, this image of shepherd and sheep is pervasive throughout the Old and New Testament. Some of you know this. And it speaks to the very heart of God for his people. Our good shepherd. We are his sheep. This brings us to the second point, to feel what Jesus felt. You're not going to feel what he feels unless you see what he sees, right? Unless you see with his eyes, not just that people exist, but what's going on in their lives, and be, then, then and only then will we begin to grow a compassionate heart for them. And I'm guilty of this. I mean, I have my agenda. I live a busy life. If I'm honest, my house, too often I view it as a refuge from ministry, not a place of ministry. Hey, I'm, I'm with people all day long. When I go home, I don't want to have to talk to my neighbors. Maybe you feel that way. Maybe you should ask the question like I've been asking, well, I mean, I, we chose our house, but maybe God put us there. Maybe his sovereignty applies to my geography. Maybe God's in control of where I live. And there's more going on than just good school districts close to shopping or whatever it is you, why you choose your home. Can't be taxes in Illinois, but whatever the reason is. <laughs> whatever the reason is, right? Is God in control of that? Did he put you there, the people next to you? Down the street from you, across the street from you, behind you? To feel what he felt. We're told that he had compassion. And that, that, that word in English doesn't really quite translate. Compassion, you know, it's, a, it's just a, it doesn't carry the weight of what's being said to us here. It comes from a, a, a the Greek word is, uh, and, and actually Dave, you could probably correct, correct my pronunciation. It's been a long time since I had New Testament Greek. But splangnisomai, if I pronounce it right, it literally, it literally comes from a root word in Greek that means your bowels, which is a weird thing to say. Jesus was moved in his bowels when he saw the crowd? He had, he had some bad chili that day when he saw the crowd. Oh, you know. well, it means your inner parts, your inwards. We might say in your gut. It's a strange word to use to express loving compassion, right? We, we say, I love you with all my heart to your wife or your husband. But if you told your significant other, I love you with all my bowels, they would think, uh, choose a different metaphor, honey. 
But it's not that different. The heart is a bloody organ that beats and pumps blood. It's not that attractive either, right? We just, we just use it that way in our culture so we understand what it means. The heart doesn't look like this. The, to the Hebrew mind, the heart was the motivational center of who you are. Your initiative, the reason you do what you do. And this word for bowels, inward guts, meant uh, the response. That thing which moves you uh, to respond. That's what Jesus is saying. He had compassion, right? It doesn't quite translate. He was deeply moved in the center of who he is. Sick to his stomach, in other words. Over what he saw. Now, a big part of why he felt this way is the fact that the religious leaders in Israel were supposed to be shepherds. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and the scribes, the religious leaders were supposed to be those looking out for the sheep, pointing them to God, caring for them spiritually. And the truth is, in Jesus' day, by and large, those leaders were fleecing the flock, taking advantage of them. And that moved him. And God has some stern things to say about that in Ezekiel 34 and Matthew 23 and other places. But the primary characteristic, I think, here is that the compassion of Jesus is his welcoming and serving love. The same word that comes from the root word of inwards or bowels is used in Luke chapter 10, verse 33. The good Samaritan was moved. We put that verse up there, Luke chapter 10, Verse 33, we're told that this good Samaritan, when he saw the man dying on the roadway, had compassion. Moved with compassion, same word. And then in Luke 15, verse 20, this is the story of the prodigal son. When the prodigal son comes home, the father has what? Compassion, same word, moved in his gut deeply. And by the way, this, the Samaritan and the father are both pictures of the love of God in parable form. Over and over again, this word is used of Jesus. The point, I think, is when you begin to see people as Jesus sees them, you begin to feel as he feels about them, and it's deep. You can't be flippant anymore. You can't be dismissive anymore. So if you don't feel that way about the average person that you interact with, and I'm honest, I don't always, perhaps it's because I don't see them the right way. Think about the people around you for just a minute. Let's just take a little minute here. Think about the people that are around you. Not, not tonight. Oh, you could think about tonight. But, I mean, in your home across the street, to your right, to your left, behind you, that you work with, maybe that you carpool kids to places with, that your kids are best friends with and you see them all the time, the people around you in your daily life, can you bring, I want you to bring a name or a face at least to your mind. What do you see? What do you feel? When you think about those people. These are challenging questions to ask ourselves. For me, too. So seeing how Jesus sees and feeling how Jesus feels, those are prerequisites to loving our neighbor. We must also do what Jesus did. Doing what Jesus did. G. Campbell Morgan, in his uh, book, The Great Physician, writing about the encounters people had with Jesus. He says, the sheep and the shepherd metaphor shows man's need being met by God. That makes sense. We're sheep in need of a shepherd. The harvest and the worker's image shows God's need being met by man. Now that, the you theologians out there, you should be going, whoa, whoa, time out, hold on. God doesn't need anything from us. He's not beholden to us. That's not what he's saying. He's saying in God's sovereignty, his divine will is going to be accomplished. He's going to accomplish his will. But in the mystery of his plan, he chooses to use us to accomplish his will. And both Im the, each image shows us how that works. You know, sheep without a shepherd, they don't do well. Do you know this? They don't fare well without a shepherd. If you, in an out-of-print book, which is worth picking up, a, a shepherd looks at Psalm 23, written by a man named Philip Keller. He, he talks about, as, as, a, as a man who worked with sheep all his life, examining that psalm. You know the, the phrase, he makes me lie down in green pastures? Do you know that sheep have to be made to rest? They are naturally stressed out, neurotic, nervous little animals. They are. They can literally, quite literally, worry themselves to death, lose weight. Of course, people don't, they're not like that at all, right? We have no. A sheep, if it falls down and is turned onto its back, in some cases, can't right itself, can't flip over and get back to its feet. 
They are naturally helpless creatures. They need to be led, need to be made to rest, they need to be righted, you know, they need to be rescued. What does it mean to do what Jesus did? The image here he gives us about these, seeing these sheep and how we should respond to it is of a farmer who has a huge crop ready for harvest, but don't have enough workers, right? He says, pray that the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few, the laborers are few. So what should we do then? Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send workers into the field. The whole image is this massive crop ready to come in, this great harvest, and there's just not enough people to get the work done. It's an interesting picture. On the one hand, God's going to accomplish his purpose. He is. On the other hand, he chooses to use us to do it. Verse 38, Matthew 9, verse 38. Looking again at that verse. Jesus says, Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Pray for workers. Now, I've heard this verse quoted often in terms of foreign missions, admissions conferences, right? Pray for workers in the harvest field. We tend to, I think, very mistakenly think of it, if we think of it at all, this way. Well, out there, the harvest is plentiful. Out there, wherever that is, you know, Zimbabwe or someplace outside of here, is where God's at work. And so we should pray that God will move in somebody else's heart to go out there and do that. It's totally removed from us, right? And we can read this wrongly, thinking pray for God to do stuff in other people's lives. And we'll give to that. And some people show up once a year and talk about it. That's not what he's saying. Jesus is not saying, ah, don't worry about all those needs out there. Just pray that somebody else does it. Pray that somebody else cares about it. How crazy would that be? If you're thinking, well, yeah, that's fine, Jeff, but I'm not, I'm not a gifted preacher. I'm not called to be an evangelist. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a missionary. Okay, but you're missing the entire point. You're missing the whole point. God wants to use all of his sheep and he's mixing metaphors here, but I think it's okay because he's God. God wants to use all of his sheep to be workers in his field. If you belong to him, if you claim Christ as Lord, even, it doesn't mean your life is perfect. It simply means you understand, like Christine came to understand in the video, that you belong to Jesus and he's your only hope and he's redeemed your life by his sacrifice on the cross and he's given you a future through his resurrection and he's called you into his kingdom. Then by definition, he wants to use you. Here's the amazing thing. If you're one of his sheep, he wants to put you to work in his field. And there's work to do. Do you notice the phrase, the harvest is plentiful? You should underline that in your Bible or highlight it, circle it, star it, put a smiley face emoji next to it if you have an online version. But what does that mean, the harvest is plentiful? What's, he, what's the context here, remember? Crowds of people, harassed and helpless, weighed down spiritually, don't, no one to lead them and guide them and point them to Jesus. That's the context. And he says the harvest is plentiful. I don't, I don't know about you, but I think I and, and many people slip into thinking that the harvest is not that plentiful in our country. Christianity is less relevant than it used to be. Nobody really wants to hear the Christian message anymore. They all presume to already know. I don't want to offend anybody. And we're already sort of viewed as narrow-minded and maybe I, people aren't that open anymore. That's not true. It's not true. Christine's story should tell us that. Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. The issue is not that there, nobody wants to respond. That's not the problem. What's the problem, Jesus says? It's not the lack of opportunity. It's the lack of people who are willing to see like Jesus sees, feel like he feels, and do what he did. That's, th that's what's lacking. What's lacking, friends, in our culture is not uh, uh, people who are hurting, who are broken, who are in need of God's love. That's not what we're lacking. I think what we're lacking is more people who see him like Jesus sees him, who feel something about it and want to do something about it. That's the issue. If you look back at verse 35 for just a minute, we see something else we haven't talked about yet that Jesus did. He went from town to town, village to village, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel, and healing every disease and affliction. I'm not, I'm not presuming that you have the power to heal that Jesus had specifically. The point is, he was both proclaiming something and doing something. He was both preaching a message and living out a message. He was both serving their actual physical needs and telling them about the love of God. Isn't that what Christine's story is? 
right? One without the other doesn't quite get it done. James says, faith without works is dead. We say often that serving people, compassion, makes the gospel visible and tangible. But if all we ever do is just feed somebody who's hungry, well, that's not the gospel. It's just humanitarian aid. You don't need Jesus for that. You put both together and you have a powerful instrument in the hands of our God. Serving people's needs, their practical, tangible needs, and telling them why. Right? Sharing the gospel. But you won't do that if you don't know who they are, if you don't see them, if you don't feel something for them. Now, it's true that not everyone is gifted or, or called to be a pastor or evangelist, but every one of us, every one of you, is gifted and called to see people as Jesus sees them, to love them as he loves them, to share of what he's given you with them. Everyone, everyone in this room tonight, if you belong to Jesus, you have the capacity to make an impact on a number greater than zero. Right? Every one of you. One of the problems in our culture is we, we're guilty of like Christian ministry is, is, is about professionalism. Well, that's what the professionals do. We come and listen to a message and hear some music and we pay them to do it. That's not the gospel. That's not the New Testament model, right? Properly understood, the, the professional minister's job is to equip you, to encourage you, to challenge you. Th- this is the church. You know, I know in our culture you pay for personal trainers and life coaches and your kids' best instructors and teachers and everything else and you, and you hope that they, and if you don't like them, you move on to the next thing. That's not what the church is designed to be. The church is designed to be God's people come together, redeemed by his son, called into his family, and then you know, like sh- sent out into the world. And the, but the sent doesn't mean somewhere else. It means like where you live, where you're going to drive to after you leave here. Your home, your street, your community. Lastly, loving your neighbor means praying for them. Jesus says, get on your knees and pray to the Lord of the harvest. Now, let's think about that. He's telling his disciples, here's how we respond to this need. We're going to serve them. Their whole life was serving them. It wasn't, he wasn't saying you're absolved from doing anything. He's saying, in addition to this, pray. Pray. In a way, we could say that those of us who belong to Jesus now, they're praying for us. A good friend of mine, a mentor named Jerry Root, who's a, just a natural evangelist, he can just talk about you ever been around people that can talk about their faith and their love for God? It's just natural. It doesn't seem weird or in, the, in the anybody's face. That's just him. He can't help himself. We go to restaurants. He's leading servers to Christ. We're freaking him out, one of the two usually, you know. <laughs> he asked this question to me years ago. I think he asked it often, but he's asked this question. He said, if God answered every prayer you prayed this week, Jeff, would there be anybody new in the kingdom? Great question. Think of you last week, every prayer you prayed. If God answered every prayer you prayed, Would anybody new be in God's kingdom? Sometimes I think, if I'm honest, my prayers are too much about me and my needs or those around me. Pray for people and let them know you're praying for them. I'm a pastor. I talk to lots of people. I pray for lots of people. Those are Christians and those who are non-Christians. I have yet, in my 20-plus years of being a professional ministry, I've yet to come across somebody when I said, I'm praying for you, and I have them say, well, would you please stop it? No one's ever said that. You don't. Sometimes they go, uh, thanks. They don't know what to make of that. But I've never had someone ask me to stop. Pray for people. And tell them you're praying for them. I have a friend who went to the same restaurant every day, over and over again, and he would always tell his, the, the manager of the restaurant he got to know, he went there on purpose, because to get to know people, that he's praying for him. I'm praying for you, I'm praying for you. I think in the beginning this guy was like, yeah, whatever, dude. You know, somebody else serve him. But over time, some issues in this man's life. And this guy comes here every day, talks, greets him by name, says, says he's praying for me. Finally, he said, can I talk to you after my shift is over? Opens up his heart to him. You don't know what God's going to do. Here's my challenge to you. Consistently pray for people in your life, by name, that they would come to know who God is. Tell them you're praying for them. And be prepared to see what God does. It's not a magic bullet. I'm not saying that the next the two mornings later everything's going to change. I'm just saying... You see what God does over time if you pray for people consistently and you let them know. So seeing our neighbor as Jesus sees them, feeling his compassion. If, I, if you're like me, 
I want to be that kind of man. But I'm, I'm not, really, all the time. I'm pretty selfish. I'm pretty focused on my family and my agenda. I don't know if you're like me. Maybe you're, you, all of you are different. I want to be that person, but I know there's a gap between who I want to be and where I am yet. Let me read to you some advice from C.S. Lewis on that. You knew he was going to make it in here eventually. He says, the rule for us is perfectly simple. Love your neighbor. Friends, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as you do this, you find one of the great secrets in the Christian life. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. Isn't that great? Don't stress out about this lack of, I don't really see everybody the way I'm supposed to see them. I don't know if I love them, but I'm supposed to love them. Just start acting as if you do. You know what will happen over time? It's like saying, well, you know what? I'm not in shape yet, clearly, so I'm not going to go to the gym. I'll wait till I'm in shape to go to the gym. Has that ever worked for anybody, ever? No. Right? Start behaving as if you love them. And you'll find your heart will follow. Little by little. Now, I think most of us, I had a conversation before this sermon started, most of us, we want to love our neighbor. We just aren't exactly sure how. So I'm going to give you a practical way how. You heard about Christine's story with the, with the shepherd's heart. And how she came to us, right, asking for help because she'd heard about this church. And over the course of fe- meeting some physical needs, God reached into her heart and her children's hearts and is doing miraculous things in her life and will use her for his purposes. So we have these bags in the back. That's why I brought this up here. It says shepherd heart. <laughs> it's supposed to say shepherd's heart. That's the name of our, our ministry under which the food pantry sits. There's enough for each of you to grab two of these. Some of you may just forget this and go out your way. I hope you don't. Here's the challenge for you, my encouragement to you. Grab two bags, and these bags symbolize two people in your life. Maybe you work next to them. Maybe you live next to them. Maybe you see them every day when you drop your kids off at school. Pray for them. And do this. Walk up to them this week. Hand them a bag and say, listen, my church... Uh, has a food pantry that's serving people all over the Tri-Cities who are in real need. Would you consider filling this bag with what's on here? It's got a list of items. Would you consider doing that to help serve our community? You get a chance to talk about your church. You get a chance to talk about the good things that God is doing. And you ask them to participate. If they say no, that's fine. If they say yes, take the bag and never return it, well, you know, chalk that up to God's grace. But then invite them. Say, listen, if you're willing to do this, would you come to our church picnic next week? Because we're going to have a huge flatbed truck. We're going to have hundreds of these bags. We're going to pack that truck to our food pantry to serve our community. If they can't come, then do you come back and pick the bag up from them if they fill it up. But it's a tangible, practical way for you and for me, I'm going to do this too, to knock on two doors, to talk to two people and say, listen, uh, I'm going to tell you about what our church is doing to meet people's needs. You can tell them about Christine if you want to. And say, would you consider being a part of that? And you know what? At the very least, you get to know somebody and talk about a little bit about the God that you love with them. And let's see what God does. So again, a- a- after, we, after we close here with the song and worship, uh, you'll have a chance as you leave to pick up two of those bags if you like. And that's the challenge. Ask two people, pray for two people to fill that bag and to come back to our church picnic next week. If they can't come back, you pick up the bag from them and you bring it and see what God does. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. We thank you that when you look at us, you do not see just people that have made mistakes or are far from you. But you see lost sheep. And you are our good shepherd. And we are are lost without you. God, open our eyes. Even as we drive home tonight, open our eyes to see people the way you see them. To be moved as you are moved with compassion for people who are in desperate need of your love. Thank you for Christine's words that there are people all around us, even in this room, sitting next to us tonight. Give us eyes to see, hearts to feel, and hands and feet to serve. We thank you, Jesus, and we praise you. Amen.